places we have selected. We will also visit Glasgow, Edinburgh and Stirling, so off we go. Gretna Green is a few miles over the Scottish border and is well signposted on the motorway. Gretna Green was famous for its runaway marriages at the old blacksmith's shop by eloping couples until made illegal in 1940. There is a marriage room complete with anvil and many couples still come here to be married over the anvil after the official ceremony for the sake of its historical significance. There is also a coach museum, restaurant, bar and gift shop. You will enjoy spending an hour here stretching your legs and getting your first taste of Scotland. At the heart of Glasgow is George Square. The monument to the novelist Sir Walter Scott is a towering 80-foot pillar at the centre of the square. The beautifully kept flower beds and benches make this a pleasant place to linger for a while. The magnificent city chambers building at one end of the square proclaims the city's Victorian prosperity of the cotton, tobacco and shipbuilding industries for which Glasgow was famous. You may go on a conducted tour of the city chambers. Inquire about the times in the main entrance. At the other end of the square are statues of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert on horseback and many statues of city dignitaries and other famous people. Glasgow also has a modern shopping centre, theatres and nighttime entertainment. Kelvin Hall, built in 1926, is the largest of its kind in Great Britain and is used for sporting activities and exhibitions. At the rear is the Transport Museum and on the other side of the road in the Kelvin Grove Park there is the Art Gallery and Museum. The building alone is very impressive and a fine example of the city's red sandstone architecture. This building houses one of Scotland's finest civic collections of paintings and displays of archaeological and historical artefacts. This unusual fountain and war memorial are in the grounds. Glasgow University occupies a commanding site on Gilmer Hill. It was designed by Sir Gilbert Scott in 1870 and incorporates a 300-foot tower and spire which can be seen from the rear of the museum. These statues are on the parapet of the nearby River Kelvin Bridge and are worthy of closer inspection. In the park you will find statues of Kelvin and Lister. This is Glasgow Cathedral. A cathedral has been on this site since 1136. The paddle steamer Preservation Society's Waverley sails from Anderson Quay for trips down the Clyde. 
This unique ship has proved immensely popular with tourists. Sir William Burrow, a wealthy Glasgow ship owner, donated his collection of 8,000 exhibits to the city of his birth. He also bequeathed £450,000 to build a gallery to house the collection of silver, tapestry, glassware, carpets and church art. Rooms from his Berwickshire home have been reconstructed to show the furnishings. Pollock House is also open to the public. Loch Lomond is 24 miles long and is known as the Queen of the Scottish Lakes and is the largest in the British Isles. Boats sail the length of Loch Lomond, calling at the various places of interest. It has several wooded islands and some splendid views of the surrounding mountains. The loch is an ideal boating, sailing, canoeing, water skiing and fishing area for salmon, trout, pike, perch and roach. The main A82 road traverses the western side, but there is no through road on the other side. People are tempted to speed by in their cars, but there are several places of interest worth stopping to see. Luss is an exceptionally pretty village on the shores of Loch Lomond at the mouth of Glen Luss. It is a conservation area of Victorian cottages with roses round the doors. Luss Highland Games are held every July. The church contains a 15th century effigy of the 6th century St. Kessog. There is a large car park for visitors wishing to stop for a break on their way to the Highlands. The Loch Lomond steamers call at the pier either to stop off to see the village or to board for a sail on the loch. Tarbet is a small village resort built around a Victorian hotel on the west side of Loch Lomond at the junction of the Araha Road and a calling place for Loch Cruises. The car park by Inverglass Hydroelectric Power Station is on a small promontory from which you can view the loch in both directions from an elevated point. We are now on the Aracher and Glencroe Road on our way to Loch Fine. This is a very pleasant drive. The Royal Borough of Inverary stands in a wooded setting on Loch Fine, facing Strone Point 
and has an open aspect with a large grassed area along a promenade. It is a very well kept town and has a wide range of tourist accommodation and is ideally situated for touring this area. There are many opportunities to take part in outdoor pursuits. Many small shops line the main street and attractions include Inverary Jail where you can visit the dungeons and see what life was like in prison in days gone by. It has wide streets with white cottage property and is one of the best examples of an 18th century planned town and a freestanding bell tower which has one of the best peal of bells. Inverary Castle is the seat of the Duke of Argyll, the head of Clan Campbell. It is a very magnificent looking castle and you have a good view from the bridge where the river meets the loch. The castle is open to the public. On display you can see the armory hall, state dining room, tapestry drawing room and the rich furnishings plus a wealth of other works of art. We are now travelling along the Crinan Canal, which was built to enable ships to reach the Atlantic from Loch Fyne without having to make the long, often stormy circuit of the Kintyre Peninsula. This pretty little village of Crinan is where the locks lift ships to a level which enables them to use the canal. They are mostly pleasure craft using the canal, and it sees very little commercial use. It is considered one of the beauty spots of mid Argyll. Three miles north of Oban, this pretty natural harbour at Ardmurtnish Bay makes an ideal anchorage for small boats. The popular resort of Oban is built around a bay which is sheltered by the long island of Carrera. It makes a good safe harbour for fishing boats and ferries which operate from here to the nearby islands. Oban has many seafront hotels, a shopping centre and is also a busy business centre. There are boat excursions to the smaller islets to see the wildlife, seals and gulls. Many fishing boats are based here and the piers are the scene of much activity with both pleasure and commercial traffic. a building which looks like the Colosseum in Rome, but it is a folly called McCaig's Tower. From the top there are some marvellous views.
This is a fine sailing area with some excellent sheltered water for all types of water sports. It is a promenade on which to go for a stroll and as the sun sets in the evening it silhouettes the outline of the islands. You can go for a day trip to the islands or maybe you have a boat of your own. At Clachan Bridge, this picturesque single arch bridge links the mainland with Seal Island. It was designed by Telford and is famous as the only bridge to span the Atlantic. Actually, it only spans the narrow Seal Sound, but it does join the Atlantic. There are some pretty views from the bridge and the public house provides refreshments. You may like to visit the Highland Arts Exhibition, which has many unusual paintings and gifts in its large shop. A small ferry will take you across to Luing Island from here, which used to be a slate quarrying area, but is now tourist orientated. We are now back on the mainland. There is some lovely countryside around Oban. The road alongside Loch Linney allows views of the mountains on the other side of the loch. Castle Stalker, one of the best sighted castles on the Lorne coast, is beautifully set among sea lapped mountains. Its tiny rock lies close inshore, but out of reach unless you have a boat. Here the A82 crosses Loch Leven to Fort William, but first we will have a look at Glencoe. As you approach Glencoe, you are confronted with the conical pub of Glencoe. The famous pass through the Glencoe is perhaps the best known in Scotland because of its association with the grim Glencoe massacre and also the wild mountain scenery in which it lies. The Scottish National Trust owns many thousands of acres in the neighbourhood, including the site of the massacre. Several of the peaks are over 3,000 feet high. Parking places are few on the road through the Glen, but do stop and have a look round at the majestic mountains, some of the finest in Scotland. From the signal rock in the vicinity came the signal for the hideous massacre of the Macdonalds of Glencoe by Campbell of Glenlion.
important resort with many hotels and several caravan sites. It is strategically situated at the base of Ben Nevis and the junction of several roads, which enable you to explore in all directions, one of the most important areas of the Western Highlands. It has a good shopping centre with restaurants and several tourist attractions for you to visit. There is no longer a fort at Fort William, as it was demolished in 1856. A chairlift will take you up the mountain for some spectacular views. Cruisers depart from the town pier. At the north end of Fort William is the entrance to Glen Nevis, whose sparkling streams tumble over the rocks. Listening to the sound of small waterfalls is a pleasure in itself. In the spring, when the snow is melting, they can become raging torrents as the water makes its way down the loch. The scenery changes at each bend in the road. Bare rugged rocks in one place, trees and vegetation in sheltered ravines, majestic mountain views at other vantage points. The scenery also changes with the seasons of the year. When you reach the end of the road, there is a car park, which gets very congested in summer. If you manage to find a parking space, it is an ideal place to start your walk to see some of the best mountain scenery in Scotland. Neptune's staircase is a flight of locks enabling boats to enter the Caledonian Canal on their way to Loch Ness and Inverness. The canal is mostly used for pleasure craft. We are now travelling along the A830 towards Malig, which is also a road to the Isles 
and a very scenic route. Malig is the end of the Road to the Isles and the car ferry terminal to Armadale on Skye. Ferries also leave for the islands of Egg, Rum, Muck and Canna. Malig is also the terminus for the West Highland Railway and a busy fishing port. It is interesting watching the boats unload their catches. You can see the jagged Coolan Mountains in the background. The road between Malig and Glenfinnan has a lot of variety, from sandy coves, which are ideal for children, superb mountain scenery and sparkling lochs. Don't forget that the railway runs through this scenic area. If you wish to leave the car behind and have a nostalgic ride on a steam train, this enables you to see the views not possible any other way, so now is your chance. Glenfinnan, where the road to the Isles passes the head of Loch Shiel, is one of the most beautiful and romantic places in the Western Highlands. It was here in 1745 that Bonnie Prince Charlie raised a standard which started the dramatic events known to us as the 45 Jacobite Rising. A short walk leads you to the monument and there is a superb view of Loch Shiel from the top. The nearby National Trust for Scotland Visitor Centre reveals the story. Above the glen is the Roman Catholic Church with its bell at ground level, which you can ring if you wish. The Fort William to Malig railway service started 100 years ago and today this special train is celebrating its centenary. The chairman of British Rail and several British Rail officials are on board and all seats are booked. It is said to be the most scenic route in the country. Building the railway was a daunting task as a considerable amount of tunnelling was involved. In places the track is shelved into the hillsides and it crosses viaducts. Embankments were built and the track winds its way alongside lochs all of which enable passengers to enjoy the splendid views, many of which cannot be seen in any other way. The steam trains run during the summer months and are a must for any steam enthusiast holidaying in Scotland. There is a break at Glenfinnan which enables passengers to visit the station museum. In places the engines are pulling hard on the steep gradients, at other times speeding down glens where panoramic views unfold. The steam locomotives are privately owned and lovingly restored to pristine condition.
It is an ideal time to leave the car and sit back, relax and enjoy the scenery. At Spain Bridge you cannot miss the Commando Monument. Stop here as it is also a vantage point from which to look back at Ben Nevis. The monument was designed by the sculptor Scott Sutherland and unveiled by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in 1952. The monument is a reminder of the bravery of Britain's commando forces in the Second World War. Fort Augustus is where the Caledonian Canal joins the western end of Loch Ness. Here there are six locks raising or lowering boats leaving or entering the loch. There are fleets of both motor and sailing boats available for holiday charter and it is interesting watching them negotiate the locks. The locks area is very well kept with many flower boxes and baskets. There are also gift shops and restaurants. Stop and have a look. Most people speed by the falls of Morrison, which lie alongside the A82, which are overhung with trees. This is a pleasant place to have a break. We are now travelling along the Kyle of Lachalsh Road, through Glen Shiel, one of the loveliest of Scottish glens and considered by many to exceed Glencoe in grandeur. Bonnie Prince Charlie lay in hiding here after the 45 uprising. Donan Castle stands on a small rocky island. A causeway links it to the mainland and it dates from 1220 and Alexander II. It was bombarded by the English in 1719 when held by the Jacobites. We are now approaching Kyle of Lachalsh. The new bridge being built can be seen in the distance and this will speed the traffic though the ferries give a good quick service over the narrow strip of water to sky. It takes approximately 10 minutes and they leave every 10 minutes at busy periods. We have now crossed over to Skye, which is the largest of the Inner Hebrides. It is the most picturesque of the Scottish islands, sometimes known as the Isle of Mist, as the weather creates some of the most beautiful effects. The Coolin Mountains are sometimes white and at other times black. The roads on Skye cannot approach the summits of the Coolin, although they give an excellent idea of the rocky terrain, peaks and valleys. On many of the lochs in Scotland you will see the floating cages in which salmon are found. Many people
people do not realize there are so many miles of roads on sky and it is not possible to see the whole of sky in a day as many try to do. It is easy to cover 350 miles seeing the island. Portree is the administration centre of the island and the main town. It is built around a perfectly sheltered harbour which is surrounded by cliffs high enough to shelter it from winds as well as rough seas. The main shopping street terminates in this square. There are camping and caravan sites nearby and also accommodation. On the Staffan Road is the jagged ridge of Storr. This 160 foot high obelisk like rock is known as the Old Man of Storr. The weather and sky can vary and within a few miles thick clouds can surround the mountains while coastal areas bask in sunshine. In the north of the island is the Museum of Highland Life, where it shows how crofters lived in the past. Apart from tourism, the main industry is still crofting and fishing although to many it is a part-time job. Below we see Uig which is an important link in the Hebridean ferry services to Tarbert in Harris and Lochmari in North Uist. Dunvegan Castle, seat of the Macleods, is where Macleod of Macleod still lives and welcomes visitors to see the historic and fascinating treasures of the castle. The castle is the main tourist attraction on Skye. Below the castle you can take a boat trip to see the islands, breeding grounds of grey seals. Most of the coastline has cliffs or is rocky and any bathing has to be done from shingle or rocky beaches. The island is 50 miles long and covers an area of 600 square miles. It is deeply indented by sea lochs, being thus broken up into a series of peninsulas. No part of the island is more than five miles from the sea. The Coolin Mountains provide some challenging climbs for mountaineers.
We are now back on the mainland on the A890 above La Halche. Plumpton is a quiet, attractive lochside village built around a crescent-shaped bay. The palm trees along the cottage line promenade give it a more southern atmosphere on a sunny day. The steep mountains rising from the loch make a splendid backdrop for the artists who regularly portray their picture on canvas. This small fishing village on an inlet of Loch Carron is now reliant on tourism with cafes, gift shops and tourist accommodation. What better way to spend your holiday than to hire a boat and have a sail? As we leave Plockton and head for Loch Carron, the road climbs and we have panoramic views both ways along the loch and towards the Torridon Mountains. Strone Ferry is no longer used and we have to go around the loch. The village of Loch Carron can be seen on the other side of the loch. We are now on the A896 heading for Kishorn, Shieldig and Loch Torridon. We now turn left over a bridge to the Pass of the Cattle, which should not be missed. The road has been much improved and the stunning views from this pass make it one of the most impressive in Scotland, with sheer drops from the road which is shelved into the hillside of the Glen. We are now returning to the A896 towards Shieldig and Glen Torridon, which has some unusual rock formations. A large area of Torridon belongs to the National Trust for Scotland. It is said to be the best mountain scenery on the mainland.
we head northwards again, along Loch Marie, the wooded islands and mountainous skyline on the far shore, with the massive outline of the peak of Slioch towering above the loch, complete the picture. Four miles before Deerloch, a small road to the left signpost Badachro leads you to these lovely creeks and sheltered inlets on Loch Gearloch. Ideal anchorages for small boats. Gearloch Harbour, where fishing trawlers land their catches. There is a local museum at Gearloch, giving an insight into the inhabitants' way of life and is run by the Heritage Society. Gearloch has a sandy beach and a variety of accommodation from self-catering to caravan. Pulyu village is situated at the head of Loch Yu, where the river Yu enters the sea. The climate is exceptionally mild here. The famous Inver Yu Gardens, established 100 years ago by Osgood Mackenzie, which now belong to the National Trust. They contain unusual plants from all over the world. As you approach Grunyard Bay, you have a fine vantage point looking down over the sandy beach and mountains. The village of Alapool is a departing place for boat trips to the Summer Isles home of grey seals and seabirds and also for a sail around the loch. The village is built on a peninsula in Loch Broom which protects this harbour from the open sea. In summer it is busy with holiday makers and is popular with sea anglers. It is also a sailing centre and there is a variety of accommodation. A number of fishing boats operate from here and it is interesting to watch the activity along the quay. We now head north again along the A835, where the countryside becomes more sparsely populated and the landscape changes. From here to Loch Inver, we pass some very unusual mountains. Here some huge sharp grey outcrops, others brown and sandstone ridges with jagged tops. This is a national park area and the landscape has remained very much the same for millions of years. Loch Inver, 
Set in some of the wildest and unspoiled scenery in Scotland, has a promenade of small cottages. It links the mouths of two rivers and is ideal for exploring this area. It is also a fishing village and Loch Inver has a tourist information centre. We now take the A869 north, but first we make a small detour. About four miles northwest of Loch Inver is Achmelvich, a small holiday centre and caravan site. It is situated near a beautiful bay with a beach of white sand, sheltered on both sides by rock faces. On a sunny day, you could not wish for anything better for bathing or sailing in the sparkling clear blue sea. We rejoin the A869. This is a remarkable road with a beautiful coastline on our left and large ponds with water lilies on our right. One steep hill after another gives exceptional views over the coastal inlets and mountain ranges. The White Mountains are not covered in snow, as this is midsummer. This is Scotland at its best as we make our way to Unapool and Blacksford Bridge, which is a highly recommended route. Dunrobin Castle, ancestral seat of the Earl of Sutherland, was originally built in the 13th century. The present castle was rebuilt in 1835 and contained a fine collection of furniture, paintings, tapestries and is also noted for its formal gardens. The lovely little town of Dormal was once a cathedral city and it dates from the 13th century. Several restorations have taken place on the cathedral and it is now the parish church. Sixteen earls of Sutherland are said to be buried in the church. The town is noted for its first-class golf course and golfing holidays. The town has a quiet centre and few shops. There is mostly residential property in this area and quiet, fine sandy beaches are nearby. Inverness is the capital of the Highlands. The splendid Eden Court Theatre provides evening entertainment for the visitor and on the opposite side of the river is Inverness Castle, a relatively modern Victorian building. The statue of Flora MacDonald, famed for helping Prince Charles, is on the esplanade of the castle. The town of Inverness is divided by the River Ness, which is crossed by a modern road bridge and several foot suspension bridges. They link the islands at the southwest of the town and are ideal for riverside walks. The river is excellent for salmon fishing. In the high street is Inverness Town House, an imposing 19th century building. Bucht Park is a good place for children to enjoy themselves. The boating lake, swings and roundabouts should keep them busy for an hour or two while their parents relax. Bucht Floral Hall has constantly changing displays of flowers and unusual plants. 
Each specimen labelled for easy identification and also a waterfall, fish pond, a raised platform area for viewing with benches to rest for a while. There is also a cafe for refreshments and tourist information. There is a modern sports centre for the athletic. Inverness Cathedral on Ness Walk is noted for its angel font, choir stalls and altar screen, Russian icons and a wooden panel of Madonna and Child. At the Clansman Hotel there is a restaurant and gift shop. You may like to go monster hunting in a submarine into the deep waters of the loch. The official Loch Ness Monster Exhibition explains the story for the existence of an unknown creature and is open daily during the season. The centre offers a selection of gift and craft shops, restaurant, hotel and audio and visual presentation about the exploration of the loch in search for the monster. It includes equipment used by the research groups. Drumna Drochit village near the mouth of the river Enric as it enters Loch Ness. Archer Castle, once one of Scotland's largest castles, was rebuilt in the 14th century and most of the existing structure dates from 1509. The castle was blown up in 1692 to prevent it falling into Jacobite hands. It stands on a promontory with views along Loch Ness. Children will love to participate in the horse riding at the riding centre near the castle. There is tuition for beginners. Codder Castle, the home of Thames, has collections of tapestries, pictures, furniture and porcelain. Granton and Spey is a summer and winter resort which is beautifully situated in Strathspey. There are several large hotels here, mostly built of granite. Granton and Spey makes an excellent touring centre with places to visit in all directions. The Spey is also a favourite place for salmon fishing and it is Scotland's longest river. Bridge, the slender arch of an ancient pack horse bridge spans the river as it tumbles through the gorge at this picturesque little village. A short distance along the road is Landmark Highland Heritage and Adventure Park. It is an excellent day out for children as it includes steam engines, nature trails, a forestry park and a multi-vision show. All the family should enjoy it. Abbey Moor is the main holiday resort for the Cairngorms. The modern complex has a large skating rink, cinema, bars, shops and restaurants. It is an all year round resort because of its proximity to the ski slopes and it also has many types of accommodation. The Rothing Murchis estate lies between the River Spey at Abbey Moor and the Cairngorms. Clay pigeon, high pheasant and grouse shooting are available for expert or beginner. All equipment is supplied and instruction can be obtained from experienced staff. The Rothy Murchis shooting ground is one of the most scenic and up-to-date in Britain. Smaller guns can be provided for women and teenagers. It is one of the fastest growing sports. The estate also caters for a wide variety of leisure pursuits including tennis, mountain bike hire, estate safari tours, bird watching, walking, farm tours, hawking and corporate hospitality. Rothy Murchis supports both red and roe deer which live in the woods and pine forests. Those interested in fishing have a choice of either loch or river. There is also a beginner's loch where you are almost certain to catch fish. The 
Space Steam Railway runs five miles from Aviemoor to Boat of Garten along part of the original route between Perth and Inverness. Here we see the 95-year-old Caledonian locomotive 825-06-0, preserved in Caledonian blue livery. Starting from Aviemore Speyside Station, not the British Rail Station, the steam train makes its way past the modern village of Dalfaber before curving east through a cutting and steaming out onto a splendid view of the Cairngorms which are seen across the River Spey, then swinging west round a series of curves through woods leading to the village of Boat of Garth. south of Aviemore is Loch Inch, a pretty loch with a water sports centre, restaurant and log cabin accommodation. The beautiful castle of Craigie Var is a 17th century tower house. It was completed by William Forbes in 1626 and presented to the National Trust in 1963. It had previously been occupied by direct descendants of William Forbes. Castle Fraser was completed around 1636 for the sixth laird, Michael Fraser. It is a seven-storey tower house and now belongs to the National Trust. It is well furnished, showing that the emphasis has changed from defence into a comfortable, stately home. Craith's Castle is a National Trust property and is another tower house castle. It is noted for its grounds and gardens, which in summer are worth a visit. The castle is also famous for its painted ceilings and dates from 1553.
Braemar is at the centre of Upper Deeside and is an excellent walking centre. It was here that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Treasure Island. Each year in September, the village is packed with people for the Braemar gathering, which is often attended by the Queen and members of the royal family. They come to watch the Highland Games with tossing the caber, piping and Highland dancing. There is also golf and fishing on the River Dee. Braemar Castle is one mile east of the village and it was a Jacobite stronghold at one time. Glam's Castle should definitely be on your list of castles to visit. It is well worth making a detour to see this excellent tower house. It has fine furnishings and historic pictures in its magnificent rooms. There is also fine porcelain and lovely tapestries. Guided tours start every 15 minutes. There is a restaurant, gift shop and beautiful gardens and grounds to walk in. Also in the village is the Angus Folk Museum. Blair Castle is the home of the Duke of Athol. This white towered castle set in wooded parkland. The castle is open to the public during the summer months. This includes the splendid drawing room and dining room which have lavishly decorated ornate ceilings. There are also displays of armour and beautifully furnished rooms. Pitlochry Power Station Dam, created for Scally Loch and the enormously popular fish ladder, which enables salmon to make their way upstream to spawn. As they climb the ladder, you may see the salmon through a window as they are electronically counted. There is an exhibition and visitor centre in the powerhouse and fishing and boating are available on Loch Fuscali. Pitlochry Festival Theatre has for many years provided visitors with six different plays in six days. It is unusual to find a theatre of this calibre in such a rural setting. It was opened by Prince Charles in 1981 the theatre was the brainchild of one man, John Stewart, who dreamed of giving Scotland a summer theatre similar to Stratford-upon-Avon. The theatre first came into being in a tent in 1951. This was remembered by the architects when designing the modern theatre. The actors, on average, have parts in four out of the six productions. The plays are of a high order and are the key to the theatre's success. Pitlochry is said to be the centre of Scotland and is certainly one of the most popular resorts with many hotels and boarding houses, caravan sites and a good range of shops in the high street. There are facilities for angling, golf, boating and an indoor sports centre. There are also many hill and forest walks nearby. The pipe band usually entertains one night a week in the summer on the sports field and piping also takes place in the car park. This sheltered valley is an ideal centre from which to explore the area. Queen's View, northwest of Pitlochry, overlooking Loch Tummel, is one of the most famous viewpoints in Scotland and was christened this name after Queen Victoria admired the view in 1866. Here, there is a forest visitor centre which will advise on walks and nature trails. Kenmore village, set at the foot of Drummond Hill, near the east end of Loch Tay, has an excellent golf course in the grounds of the castle. Here we see the post bus, which is a very useful service.
see the castle, which is sadly no longer in use. Aberfeldy is a small resort town noted for salmon and trout fishing. It has a number of interesting antique and bric-a-brac shops and a general wade bridge over the River Tay. There has been a Dewar distillery at Aberfeldy since 1896. A crucial advantage of the site is the quality of the water supply from Pitilly Burn. It has served illicit distilleries for centuries. Dewar whisky is famous all over the world. The distillery still produces the single malt which is at the heart of the Dewar's white label. Notice the padlocks on the stills and spirit safes. All parts of the distilling process are held under lock and key and supervised by the customs. You may enjoy a free guided tour of the distillery and sample their unique single malt whisky. Schoon Palace, home of the Earl and Countess of Mansfield, is a must for tourists visiting Perth. It has rich furnishings, pictures, clocks, furniture and rare porcelain collections. It was the crowning place for the kings of Scotland. There are extensive grounds in which to wander. It is one of Scotland's most interesting houses, so don't miss it. Loch Erne is a popular water sports resort where you can hire equipment for water skiing and sailing. There is also accommodation and shops and a golf course at St Philan's on the east end of the loch. into the River Lenny. Two miles downstream are the Lenny Falls where the river tumbles through a narrow cleft in the rocks. Here again you are likely to miss them behind the trees. The busy tourist town of Callander, standing on the banks of the River Teeth, is an ideal base for visiting the Trussocks. Sir Walter Scott was a frequent visitor to the area. Callander has a fine selection of gift shops, many hotels and caravan parks. Near the centre of Callander High Street, a church has been converted into the Rob Roy Visitor Centre, which unfolds the story of this hero, or villain, we will leave you to decide. Down by the river is a peaceful place for a picnic or a stroll along the footpath. Aberfoyle is a pleasant resort village from which to visit the Trussocks. The steep Dukes Road climbs above the village to the David Marshall Lodge and various high vantage points.
If you wish, you can go for a sail in Loch Catron. The loch is ten miles long and lies in the heart of the Trossachs. Your trip on the steamship, Sir Walter Scott, begins at the Trossachs Pier. The scenery unfolds as you smoothly steam along. The clear waters of Loch Catron are a reservoir for the city of Glasgow. The steamship, Sir Walter Scott, has been sailing on the loch since 1900 and has given pleasure to many thousands of passengers over the years. The ship was transported from Loch Lomond overland by horse and cart in a knock-down form and it still retains the original steam engines. Stirling figures prominently on the tourist trail because of its important historic connections. The castle has been a military stronghold since medieval times. Mary Queen of Scots was crowned here and her son James VI was baptised in the chapel. Stirling's importance was that it was the first bridge on the River Forth and the castle is defended by cliffs on three sides. Several important battles were fought nearby, Bannockburn and Stirling Bridge. Just below the castle is Mars Wark, the front façade of the townhouse of the Earl of Mar, who was the keeper of Stirling Castle and Regent of Scotland during the minority of James VI following the 1750 Jacobite Rebellion. The Royal Arms of Scotland are above the main gate and the Arms of Mar are on the towers. Argyll's Lodgings was the home of William, Earl of Stirling. In 1620 he was responsible for starting a new colony in Nova Scotia and above the inner porch the Earl's coat of arms is combined with the badge of Nova Scotia. The house has also served as a military hospital and a youth hostel. The Mercat Cross overlooks two cannons in the Market Square, which was once the focus of the town's trading activity. Nearby, the Church of the Holy Rood, one of its ministers was beheaded in the 17th century and it has a colourful history. Cowan's Hospital, or the Guild Hall, was built in 1649 with funds left by John Cowan, a wealthy sterling merchant, to help poor and sick members of the Merchant Guild. A statue to John Cowan looks down from above the entrance. It has also been used for military purposes and as an infectious disease hospital. The cannons came from Russia during the Crimea War. The Erskine Church is now a youth hostel. The tomb of the church's founder lies outside the church. to King Robert the Bruce's victory over the English in 1314 and the Scottish National Trust Heritage Centre which is well worth a visit by anyone interested in the history of this area. Fifteenth-century Stirling Old Bridge was for four centuries the lowest bridging point over the River Forth the Wallace Monument, erected on Abbey Crag, is a 220 feet high landmark which can be seen for many miles and recalls Scotland's famous freedom fighter, William Wallace. 
you can climb the 246 steps to enjoy one of the finest views in Scotland. About a mile to the south is an area known as the Links of the Forth and Cambus Kenneth Abbey dating from 1147. James III and his Queen were buried here in 1488. Queen Victoria erected a monument to both of them. There are also extensive foundation ruins. The elegant Forth Road suspension bridge with this huge span saves a long detour around the Firth of Forth. From South Queen's Ferry you have a splendid view of the bridge and the vehicles crossing look like toys. The modern design is sharp in contrast to the nearby rail bridge. The rail bridge is like a giant mechano set with its cantilever arches and steel girder construction. In 1990 it celebrated its centenary and it is a credit to all who worked on it. Hope Toon House is a splendid mansion, one of the finest of its period, and stands in parkland overlooking the Firth of Forth. Several architects had a hand in its design, including Sir William Bruce and William and Robert Adam. It contains many rich treasures and a museum. Visitors may walk in the park along nature trails. Edinburgh is the capital of Scotland. We start our tour at the Scott Memorial in Prince's Gardens. This Gothic spire towers above the statue of this famous author. In the niches are statuettes of 64 characters from Scott's novels and poems. You may climb the monument if you wish. This city is steeped in history and only ranks second to London in importance. Edinburgh has a cosmopolitan air and you will hear languages from all over the world being spoken by visitors as you walk along the street. These are pavement artists and entertainers and the magnificent Duke of Wellington equestrian statue. This is the floral clock opposite and the sheltered gardens below the castle. In the marquee, concerts and dancing displays are held. The National Gallery contains a large collection of paintings from various important schools. The Royal Scottish Academy stages exhibitions and other collections are also on view. Edinburgh Castle, with rock faces defending it on three sides, has been a stronghold and royal residence for 900 years and one of the major attractions of Edinburgh. The military tattoo takes place here each summer. Princess Street is lined with gardens on one side with open views across to the castle. Statues of Tom Guthrie, John Wilson, David Livingston and Alan Ramsay. Benches to rest for a while and watch the world go by. On the other side of the road are shops, clubs, hotels and public buildings. It is said to be one of the most beautiful streets in Europe. Holyrood House is used by the royal family when they visit Edinburgh and where they have apartments. The Queen is usually in residence for a short period each summer. In the absence of the royal family, it is open to the public. The site dates back to the 12th century when David I founded the Abbey of Holyrood. All that remains of the Abbey is the ruined nave, which is at the rear. Successive Scots kings have stayed here and it was eventually expanded into the modern palace of Holyrood House. The main development of the palace was carried out by Charles II. We are on Carrollton Hill. Here is a city observatory and the Nelson Tower Monument from which a time ball is lowered at noon and at the same time a cannon fired from the castle. 
There is also the National Monument and Playfair Monument. From up here you can look down onto the city and see the many famous buildings which we only have time for a close look at a few. The impressive skyline of mellow stone buildings and array of domes, spires and towers stretches as far as the eye can see. Also, the crowned steeple of St Giles Cathedral can be seen. Cannon Gate Church is at the lower end of the Royal Mile. This street has been traversed by many monarchs over the centuries. It is lined with historic buildings like the Huntley House Museum and the Toll Booth, now also a museum, the city chambers, parliament buildings, statues and monuments. See the intricate detail, they all have a story to tell. At the rear of St Giles Cathedral is this ornate Merkit Cross. You can spend all day in the Royal Mile exploring the winds and alleys unusual shops and sideshows. There is no end to the discoveries you will make. There are many cafes, bars and restaurants in which to rest. Allow plenty of time to see everything. You can take an open top bus which will take you on a tour of the city sites and help to establish your bearings before you decide where to start exploring the city. In front of the mass of St Giles Cathedral, artists taking part in the festival spill out onto the street. They travel from many parts of the world to take part in the festival. Singers, musicians, writers and entertainers. You can spend a week visiting the various venues and see a huge variety of talent. There is certainly no shortage of interesting things to do and see here. This is St Mary's Cathedral. This unusual three-towered building has a 276 foot high spire. It was designed by Sir Gilbert Scott and building commenced in 1874. The Bank of Scotland headquarters is a fine example of Scottish architecture. This part was once the townhouse of the Melvilles and has a fine statue of the Earl in the garden. The adjoining bank building has a very ornate façade. This column is in a square in front of the bank. George Street runs parallel to Princess Street and at the intersections are statues of Prime Ministers and famous people. Several buildings of interest are also in the street. In the centre of Charlotte Square is the equestrian statue of Prince Albert. Take a closer look at the smaller statues embellishing the plinth. If you do visit Edinburgh, a detailed guidebook is recommended to fully appreciate the treasures of this beautiful city. I hope you have enjoyed this tour of Scotland, but I assure you that we have only scratched the surface of this interesting part of the country. Goodbye from Scotland.